Good morning. Let's open our service this morning and stand and sing just a closer walk. Stand as we sing. seated. Good morning. We welcome you to Beulah Baptist Church. Glad you made it here via car or boat or whatever it was you used to get out to the church this morning. It's good to see little Tessa there. She was getting into that song there. She was just walking around and, and so that's that's great. So but we are glad you are here and we hope that you are blessed as a result of being here in the house of the Lord this morning. There's no better place to be on the Lord's day than the Lord's house with the Lord's people. And so through the singing and through the fellowship and through the proclamation of God's word, we want you to be pointed to Christ. We want you to, to come to know Christ if, if you don't uh, have a relationship with him, if you haven't been saved. And we also want you to be strengthened in your faith. And so um, we just hope a blessings are upon you this morning as you gather here. If you're a newcomer, uh, we'd like for you to find one of the little blue cards. They're in the pew racks and fill that out with your name and other information that's required and then put that in the offering plate as it comes by just a little bit later in the service that gives us an opportunity to express to you how glad we were uh, to have you here uh, this morning so let's pray together heavenly father we thank you so much for the beauty of this day father it's it's been rainy it's been extremely wet but father we thank you for just the the shelter that this building provides and for the wonderful place we have here to worship we ask that as we meet together this morning that our focus would not be upon one another, that our focus would not be upon the, the rest of the day and things that we have to do or the coming week and responsibilities that are before us. But Father, may our focus be upon you. May we be grounded in your word. May we be uh, just touched by your spirit. And we pray, Father, that our wills would be empowered to follow you in greater ways. We thank you, Father, for all the blessings that we have for our family and for our friends. We thank you for the wonderful fellowship of this church. But most of all, we thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and for the new life that he has given us through him. Lead us and guide us in all that we do here this morning, and we'll be faithful to give you the glory for all that's accomplished. For it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Let's continue on with our service and stand and sing, They Will Know We Are Christians. Stand and sing. This time, Jay's going to come and share our announcements. Morning. Good morning. All right. There is no AB men's meeting tonight, so that's been canceled, so be aware of that. Let's see. We're uh, getting uh, people signed up for the Easter walkthrough, which is going to be on March 29th and 30th, so see, see Marilyn for that. Uh, so she was, you know getting all the good parts out now. And then also uh, tomorrow night, six o'clock, the, let's see, I'm not even sure what we're calling this committee, the 200th anniversary committee. We'll be meeting over in the, uh, I'm assuming the Richmond Week on Ministry Center there. So uh, come on out for that. 
And let's see, what else? Uh, on your, ins uh, on your uh, announcements there, there's the, you'll see the Russian mission trip, which I'm sure Pastor will be talking more about. We get the spring retreat and rally going on uh, March 24th, and then uh, the bus trip to Lancaster. That's coming up. Uh, the sign-ups are, you know, everything for now, so that's later on in October. But so if you're wanting to go on that, please uh, check that out. And then uh, I'm sure we'll be seeing some stuff. Uh, there's the American for Christ offering, so you can know that that's coming up. Um, on your insert there, there's all the uh, activities coming up for March. So March Madness starting, so be ready for that. So, and then, uh, you know, can you believe it? You know, here's the March calendar. So here we are. It's here. Well, almost later this week because uh, you'll see uh, uh, in the insert there too with uh, Jada's spaghetti dinner fundraiser. Let's see, I got a picture. Wait a minute. There's. Oh, wait. There's the men's breakfast. Okay, got to show you that picture first. There you go. So th they all got together for that, had a good time. How many went for that? That was about nine, nine. nine of us. Nine of us. So nine from Beulah went out to that. So uh, they had a real good time with that. And then uh, here, okay, here's the spaghetti dinner. So this was actually from the Mountain Statesman. So uh, be sure to uh, invite your friends, neighbors, people even you don't like. You know, we can we can serve them too, spaghetti. So uh, that way, uh, you know, Jada can you know have have a real successful uh, fundraiser here for this for her mission trip. So uh, please, anything you can do to help out with that would be much appreciated. So it's going to be this uh, Saturday, there from uh, two to seven. So. Uh, Come on out and have some good good food. All right, let's see. What else did there was a, a oh yeah, quarters for Lane. That's right, that's in there too. And this is a recent picture of, of Lane there. And I guess he begins his third round of chemo this week. So uh, we got the the quarters bucket back there. So and somehow the quarters also you can put dollars and tens and twenties i think it'll even take a hundred and i don't you know but but it's back there so uh, if you can uh, help out with that that'd be much appreciated and let's say oh uh, jared blackhurst he made it into the the paper this uh this week so he remember how it, well he was doing with football so i'm sure we'll, we'll hear a lot with him with uh wrestling and uh so good job jared and let's see birthdays we got busty weber jada charlton bryn rogers ali knotts Louis riffle riffle uh, Laura Lafferty and Diana Swisher. So happy birthday. Uh, no anniversaries this week. And our scripture reading comes out of 2 Corinthians. And Dawn's going to come and read that to us. Good morning. We're 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17 through 21. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not in putting their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God was pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Thank you, Donna. And if our ushers will come, we'll take up the morning offering. <laughs>
Jerry Eisner, if you'd pray for the offering, please. time we have a special from the choir. Thank you, choir. At this time, we have special music by Pam Schrock. Good morning. Morning. This is an old song that I've sang here before. I started singing it when I was about 13, I think, and that was a long time ago. <laughs> Jesus said 
Thank you, Pam, for that message and song. Let's take our hymnals and turn to 231. Jesus saves. We'll sing the first and last verses, and we'll go ahead and let the kids go downstairs for junior church. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, bear the news to every land, climb the steeps and cross the waves, onward tis our Lord's command, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. And the last, give the winds a mighty voice, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, let the nations now rejoice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Shout salvation full and free. Highest hills and deepest caves. This our song of victory. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. And as we, we're going to sing the family of God, but we'll let the choir go down while we sing the family of God. <coughs> been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood, join heirs with Jesus as we travel this hour, for I'm part of the family, the family of God. Amen. You may be seated. Somebody asked me 
we're still not shaking hands? Well, we're going to do that. It's flu season. So if you want to shake hands, if you want to hug after the church service is over, have at it. Uh, I was doing a lot of that this morning before church. We just don't want to put folks on the spot right now. Uh, if you're concerned about that, we want to kind of go easy on that. The flu season seems to be waning some, and so that's a good thing. Uh, so, but that's the reason why we've changed up our service a little bit, if anybody was wondering. Okay, we come to our prayer time, and we've always got a lot of uh, concerns on the prayer list, so be in touch with those and, uh, and know what's happening there. But there's three things that I wanted to mention to you, especially to, to keep in your prayers. Um, and that, well, actually four things. We want to pray for the lost. And pray for those folks by name that you're remembering in prayer that God would move in their lives and work in their hearts. Um, and then we also want to pray for uh, the Russia trip coming up. Uh, July the 20th through the 30th are the dates in which we're going. And we've had a good response from across the state. We've probably got three or four churches that are participating. We don't have anybody from Beulah that's definitely on board yet, but you want to join us, you can. Uh, the cost is $2,500. It's really not that much when you start raising money, and a lot of folks like to help people go on mission trips. So, but uh, the first payment's due March 10th. Uh, and so see me if you'd like to learn more about that, and uh, we'll be glad to, I'll be glad to share with you what you need. Uh, but it's a wonderful opportunity to go to the Raison Oblast of Russia and see what God is doing among the Baptist churches over there. We're probably going to have about 10 to 15 in this group. Uh, so we'll have a good, good group. And uh, so you'll want to be a part of that and all the, see all the things God is doing there. Second thing we want to pray for, we want to pray for the, the situation with the teachers and the legislature. We just want to pray some kind of deal would be struck. Uh, we all love our teachers and we're concerned about them. And so let's just, just pray some kind of deal can be struck in the very near future. Um, and, uh, and also pray for their safety. Uh, I mean, they're out there standing beside the road and sometimes that can get hazardous. And, and so just pray that God protects them. Um, but uh, anyway, pray for that, that situation. It's always good to lift those matters up to God in prayer. Uh, and then I want to say a word about the Fairmont Baptist Association. Uh, this was in the news this last week. The, the, the First Baptist Church of Fairmont was talking. Some representatives from there were talking. The association was not saying anything. Uh, but it's gotten out to the press. And so just to share what's happening, the First Baptist Church of Fairmont and the pastor there have, have taken the stance that homosexuality is not a sin. Uh, and so, and that's a very, very serious doctrinal error. Uh, it's, it's, it's a deviation from what the Bible says. It affects all kinds of different basic doctrines. And so, um, as a result, uh, the Fairmont Baptist Association is seriously considering disfellowshipping them from the association. Uh, but this is not trying to look down upon any one group of people. This is not a lack of love or compassion or desire to ministry. Minister, as a matter of fact, this is a desire to make ministry more effective. And you certainly can't minister to the lost if you're mixed up and twisted as to what sin is and what sin isn't. Uh, and so this, this is a, 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 just a desire to, to maintain biblical standards uh, and so that we can minister to all groups uh, more effectively. So, but pray for the Fairmont Baptist Association, pray for the First Baptist Church of Fairmont, uh, that, that God would guide them and bring them to their senses and the pastor there, and then pray for the state convention as they're kind of overseeing this right now. And there'll be a statement issued when all, everything is said and done. Right now it's just in process, but we certainly want to pray uh, for this situation. There's so much of this going on in society where we twist scripture to say what society wants it to say rather than what it actually says. Uh, and so anyway, this, this is what's happening there. And, and the Fairmont Baptist Association is working to counter that, uh, but all of that's not complete yet. So, but pray for that, uh, that whole situation. So, so all of these things we want to lift up to God in prayer uh, and just ask God to move and work. And if you've got an unspoken concern, uh, feel free to lift that up to him as well. Uh, God wants us to cast all our cares upon him that he may sustain us. But uh, we'll have a few moments of private meditation, then after that we'll be led together in our prayer. Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, this morning we thank you for so many things. We thank you for the health that we possess. It may not be perfect, but we've been able to come here this morning and we're in better shape than many that we see around us. Father, we thank you and praise you for that. We thank you for our families and for the love that we share with them, for our children, for our grandchildren, for parents and grandparents. Father, we thank you for the encouragement that they give to us and for the nurture that they provide and for just the blessing that they are. Father, we thank you for this congregation, for all of its people, their all their devotion to you, for the inspiration that they are to us. This morning, Father, we pray that we would just present our lives as living sacrifices to you. Father, there are so many things that vie for our attention. There are so many things that compete for our affections. And so may our focus be upon Christ. May our hearts be set upon him. And may all other things pale in comparison to the devotion that we have towards Jesus our Lord. This morning, Father, we pray that as we move forward with this service, that we would be more grounded in your word. Help us to learn more of the guideline and the commandments that you have given us for living. And Father, we pray most of all that we would be pointing to Christ and that we would understand a bit more all of the blessings and all of the wondrous things that we have as we find ourselves in Christ as believers. Father, this morning we ask that you would minister to the folks that are planning on going to Russia uh, in July, that you would just bring together the team that you would have to travel there. And Father, may we be effective in encouraging our brothers and sisters in Christ there. May we lift them up in prayer even now and then as we learn more of their needs, may we be faithful to support them and help them financially in the challenges that they face. Father, we pray for our teachers and for the legislature. Father, we pray that a deal would soon be struck. Father, this is something that is of great concern to all of us. We love our teachers. We thank God for all that they do. And so we just pray that, that you would work in this whole situation. Father, we pray for the First Baptist Church of Fairmont. Bring them and their pastor to their senses and, and back to a biblical footing and back to orthodoxy. And Father, we pray for the leaders of the Fairmont Baptist Association as they're dealing with this matter in a biblical fashion. Father, continue to give them wisdom and insight as well as all the members of the association and all the other churches. Father, we pray that we as followers of Christ would be faithful to, to be committed to your word and have our lives grounded upon the principles that it gives to us rather than the, than the fads that society offers to us today. Heavenly Father, we pray that you forgive us of our sins. We thank you that as we ask forgiveness of our sins, as 1 John 1, 9 says, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We pray for the lost. Father, use us to reach them. We pray for our country. Father, forgive us of our sins as a nation. And we pray that you would bring healing to our land. Guide us now as we open up your word. May it speak to our hearts. May it illumine our minds. May it empower our wills. For it's in Christ's precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. If you're not already in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21, please turn there uh, and follow along with me. And we're going to do some other verses as well. And I really tried my best. You have a three-point outline in, in, your, in your bulletin. And I thought for sure I was going to be able to get through this in one message. And I'm not. Uh, and so we're going to do the first point this morning. We'll do the next two points next Sunday. There is so much in 2 Corinthians 5.17. There's so much there to handle that that's just one message in and of itself. And so we're going to focus on that, and then we'll go on with the rest of the passage next Sunday. As everybody knows by now, Billy Graham passed away this last week at the age of 99. Had he lived until November, he would have been 100 years of age. And I remember as a child watching his crusades on television, and some of you may have attended one of the crusades, or you may have been like me, you just watched them on television, but there was a pattern that, that followed in all those crusades. It was a very consistent pattern of sharing the gospel with others. There would be special Christian music, 
Usually there'd be some special guest that would brought it, be brought in and they would share with the crowd. And then there would usually be a large crusade choir be led by Cliff Barrows with his upbeat tone and his upbeat presence and they would all be singing together. And then George Beverly Shea would normally come out. I know I'm just saying things that you, most of you folks remember. He would come out with his beautiful baritone voice. He would sing a song, How Great Thou Art, There Is Eyes on the Sparrow, or something like that. And then an evangelistic message would be shared by Reverend Graham. And at the close of the message, he would extend an invitation for people to come forward to receive counseling and to pray for Christ to forgive them of their sins. And as the hymn, Just As I Am, was played and it was sung, hundreds would make their way to the platforms. We had a testimony yesterday morning in the men's prayer breakfast of one life that was touched as a result of Billy Graham's ministry. I have read countless words of praise for him this last week. I've watched a couple of documentaries. Sirius Now, the satellite radio uh, uh, company, they have one channel that's devoted to Billy Graham. And so you can go to that and you can hear one crusade message after another. And Jeannie were uh, were, nah, were listening to that for a little bit this weekend. So, but regardless, uh, it's safe to say that he was the greatest evangelist of the 20th century. I don't think there's any disputing that. Um, God worked through this ordinary man from North Carolina in a very extraordinary way. And one of the most popular tracts published by the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association is Steps to Peace with God. Maybe you've seen that, maybe you've used that. Uh, I've used it in the past in, in sharing uh, the Christian faith with people. In it, four steps are presented. Step one, God loves you and has a plan for your life. Step two, man is sinful and is separated from God. Three, God sent his son to die for your sins. Four, would you like to receive God's forgiveness? Bible verses are given for each step. That's a good tool. A track is a good tool to use in sharing the gospel. You don't want to just hand it to someone and have them read it on their own. It's best to share it with them and talk through that with them and have a conversation with them. And at the close of the track, there is a prayer to pray. And it says, Dear God, I know I'm a sinner, and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe Jesus Christ is your son. I believe that he died for my sin and that you raised him to life. I want to trust him as my Savior and follow him as Lord. From this day forward, guide my life and help me to do your will. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So as I said, I've used that track, and perhaps you've used it too. Countless of other Christians have used it as well, or something very similar, and many people have been brought to Christ through the Holy Spirit working and through God moving as a result of that particular tool. But there is no greater need for mankind today than to be reconciled with God, to have peace with God. Listen to what Colossians 1, verses 21 through 22 says. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. So the question that sometimes comes to mind or often comes to mind for people is how do I really know for sure that I am reconciled for God, to God? How do I know for sure that that has happened? And, the, and there's a mistaken idea that folks get today, and it seems like it's an increasing problem, that folks will think, well, just because I went through four steps, and just because I understand four steps, and just because I recite a prayer that's given to me, or just because I walk down an aisle, well, that means that I am saved. And that means that I've been reconciled to God. And even though God can work through those things to reconcile you to him, that in and of itself is not what it means to be reconciled to God. God is working in Christ to bring you to himself. So you don't find assurance of salvation based upon something you did. You may think, well, I've, I've gone to church for years. And I've been in this place, and I, I like to sit in the same seat all the time, unless somebody else is sitting there, and then I'll find somewhere else to sit. And I don't like that too much, but I'll find somewhere else to sit. But I've been here for years. And so because I come to church for years, well, then I know I'm a Christian. Or some folks may say, well, I walked down the aisle a long time ago and got wet, and so I'm, I know that I'm a Christian now because I did those things. Or I made a commitment, and because I made this commitment, I know now that I'm saved. But you don't find assurance with God and knowing that you're born again by something that you've done for God. 
You find assurance and salvation in what Christ has done for you and what he is doing in you. So in this morning's passage, Paul describes being reconciled to God. It's the greatest need that you have and I have and mankind has today. He describes what it means to be at peace with God, to be reconciled with God. And so through this description, you gain an understanding of what a life reconciled to God looks like. You get an understanding of, of, of how it is, of how life is once a person has been saved and is reconciled with him. So Paul doesn't focus here so much on how to be at peace with God, but how your life looks when you are at peace with God. And so we're going to go through this this morning. We're going to do point one, as I said, this morning, and then the next two uh, points next Sunday morning. First of all, being reconciled through Christ brings regeneration. Being reconciled through Christ brings regeneration. Verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Now, the phrase new creation, that term means regeneration. That means that God has given you life. Regeneration is a theological word. It's one with which every believer should be acquainted. Regeneration, new life. It literally means to be born again. And you've heard a lot of people saying, well, I'm a born-again Christian. Well, this, this is another word for that, regeneration. It's not something you do for God. It's something God does for you. And you need to grasp that, and you need to understand that, because this is critical. It's a supernatural act. It is God giving life to a soul that is dead in sin. So let's turn to Ephesians 2. Keep your finger in 2 Corinthians 5 and turn over to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. And it says there, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of the flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Now being dead in sins and then being made alive in Christ, that is regeneration. God is doing that. You cannot change yourself. You cannot save yourself. Well, preacher, I, I come to church all the time, and I try to read my Bible, and I try to do right by others. Isn't that good enough for God? No, it's not. You need to be saved. You need to be regenerated, and you can't do it on your own. God has to act in you. God has to regenerate you. That's the only hope that you have, and Christ does that. And you want to write this down if you're taking notes. Regeneration is not something you do for God. Regeneration is something God does for you. Understand that. Grasp that because it's a very basic, basic concept in Scripture. In John chapter 3, one of the Pharisees, Nicodemus, he approaches Jesus by night to talk with Jesus. Now, as you probably know from the Scripture, the Pharisees and Jesus didn't get along very well. Uh, there was tension there. Jesus was calling them out. Uh, on one occasion, he called them whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. Those are fighting words in that day. Uh, and so he, he mentioned that, and, and they were calling into question a lot of the things that he was doing. And so the Pharisees as a group were set against Jesus, and Jesus was set against them. But one of the Pharisees, Nicodemus, was really interested in Jesus, and he really wanted to know more about what he was teaching. He was departing from the Pharisee party line, so to speak, so he wants to talk to Jesus, and so rather than meeting with Jesus in broad daylight, he has a meeting at night, and he begins talking with Jesus, and he's, and he's asking questions. He's trying to learn more, and one of the first things that Jesus says to him, he says, you must be born again. In, Nick, in John 3, 3, it says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, unless one is regenerated, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
So regeneration is a divine change. It's an imparting of new life where there was no life. And it happens to you because of what Christ has done on the cross. And when you look to Christ... And when you ask him to save you of your sin, it's more than just a ticket to heaven. It's God bringing you to life out of the deadness of your sin into the light and the life of Christ. And it transforms your whole character. It transforms your whole outlook on living. It's something that changes you literally from the inside out. The Old Testament speaks of regeneration. When the prophet Isaiah, or prophet Ezekiel says in Ezekiel 36, 26, he said, Ezekiel 36, 26, he says, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put in you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. So now in order to understand regeneration, you have to acknowledge that all people apart from God are spiritually dead. You are dead in your sin. That's, 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 that's a bad condition to be dead. I mean, you have no spiritual life at all. Now, some folks will say, well, you know, as I look around me today, I, I really think folks are just basically good. You know, they're, they're good people, and they're good-hearted, and they're kind, and they're loving, and, and pretty much you can trust them, and, and, and it's just, overall, I mean, down deep inside, they're really good. Well, that's a nice sentiment, but it's not biblical. According to God's Word, we are not inherently good, we're inherently sinful, that's our problem. If we weren't inherently sinful, there'd be no need to be born again. But you are so bad in your sin, you are so dead in your sin, that you've got to be given divine life. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? On Valentine's Day, less than two weeks ago, a gunman killed 17 people in a brutal school shooting in Parkland, Florida. It was a heartbreaking tragedy. And the thing is, it's not the first time it's happened. You know that, I know that. But what is the source of this horrible problem in, in American society? This kind of vile thing happens again and again and again. Now you'll hear a variety of opinions from politicians and pundits and the public and everybody has a different opinions as to what, what the problem is. But the Bible indicates that the heart of man's problem has always been the problem of man's heart. He has a heart of stone. He has a heart that's in rebellion against God. And you, so you see violence, and you see murder, and you see adultery, and you see all kinds of other things that constantly come to the surface. It's the state of his heart. And only new life in Christ can ultimately resolve the issue. People desperately need new life in Jesus. Chuck McDonald and I were sitting together at the prayer breakfast yesterday morning, and uh, we were talking about this subject, and I sat with Chuck because there's no place else to sit. So, but he's, he's sitting there, no, seriously. Uh, we had a good conversation there, and, and we were talking. But, but one of the things he mentioned that I just totally agree with, he said, you know, he said, what ha needs to happen? He said, Jesus just needs to get a hold of folks. And that's exactly right. Jesus needs to get a hold of folks. And we need to pray that God would bring new life and he would bring regeneration because that is what we need. The Bible indicates that the problem was with man's heart. People have a desperate need for new life in Christ. There's a critical need to be regenerated by God. Now, once you were saved, once you were regenerated, then your life has changed. It's not like you just get a pass for heaven and you just keep on living the way you've always been living and doing the things you've always been doing and all that and you've got the ticket for heaven in your hand. That's not the way it works. Matthew 121 says that you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sin. God brings you out of your sin through salvation and through rebirth, gives you a new nature that follows after God. Your whole life changes and by saving you from sin, you're saved from hell. But it's not just to save you from hell, it's to save you from sin. So we need to understand that. Galatians 5, 22 through 24. It describes the life of a person who has been regenerated in Christ. Listen to what these verses say. Paul says there, the fruit of the Spirit, the evidence of the Spirit, the manifestation of the Spirit, is love, joy, peace, patience, 
kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. You have a new way of living. This morning, are you at peace with God? Have you been reconciled to God? You can't reconcile yourself. God has to do that for you through Christ. And if you have been reconciled with God, there will be evidence in the way that you think, in the way that you speak, and the way that you live. Well, pastor, you're saying I have to do certain things to be saved. No, I'm not. I'm saying that when you're saved, there will be manifestations of that. Because you are saved, there will be a change. The Apostle Paul, before receiving new life in Christ, was a religious man, a very religious man. He was a Pharisee, but he was a cruel man. It is his express purpose to go from place to place persecuting Christians, making their lives miserable because he wanted to stamp out this movement of people that were following after Christ. And it was an affront to the Jewish faith. He wanted nothing to do with that. He wanted to eradicate them. But then on a journey to Damascus, everything changed when the living Christ appeared to him. His heart was transformed. His outlook changed. And the man who was once a persecutor of Christians became one of the greatest leaders of them. It wasn't Paul doing the change. God changed him. And God will change you today as you look to Christ. He was regenerated through Jesus Christ and what he has done on the cross. We go up to Anna Jarvis every week for the Good News Club. We had a break last week with Wednesday school last week, but we normally go up there on Thursdays and have the club. And it's a wonderful thing to work with the children and see God's Holy Spirit working in them to, to bring new life. Now, there's a common misunderstanding out there that, that all, many folks have that a child can't be saved because he or she isn't mature enough to make such an important commitment. I've, I've heard that said. That they're just not mature enough to make such an important commitment. That attitude reveals a fundamental misunderstanding of what it means to be saved. Being saved is not a commitment of the will. It's not an accomplishment of the mind. It is a divine act. God does it. A child does need to realize that he or she is a sinner and that a sinner's only hope is Christ. But a theology degree or an adult maturity level is not required. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, unless you become as children, you can't enter the kingdom. James Dobson was saved when he was three years old. Corey Tim Boom was five. Jonathan Edwards, the great Puritan preacher, was seven. Charles Spurgeon has once said, a child of five, if properly instructed, can as truly believe and be regenerated as an adult regeneration is not what a child does for god it's not what an adult does for god regeneration is the new life and the new heart that god imparts to you as you look to christ then the evidence of that new life and new heart begins to spring forth in godly attitudes and godly desires and a godly lifestyle it's a wonderful thing to see it never gets old to see a life that's been apart from God and in the darkness of sin brought into the light of Christ and changed and you think where did that come from that person has a new disposition that person has a new outlook that person isn't the same as he or she was previously it's because God has saved him or her he's regenerated them second Corinthians 5 17 again says therefore if anyone is in Christ he is a new creation the old has passed away behold the new has come now the greek word behind this this second sentence in verse 17 gives more insight into what exactly happens with regeneration the greek words here the old has passed away that phrase is in the aorist tense and what that means is is that one thing happened at one particular point in time in the past it happened then at one point in the time it's over the old has passed away it's done but then it goes on to say the new has come. That's not in the aorist tense, that's in the perfect tense, which means that something has happened in the past, but the effects of that are continuing into the present. And so to, to say here, to say actually that the new has come 
and continues to come would be really kind of a literal translation of that. So God changes you, and the old sin nature loses its grip on you because you have a new heart. You have a new mind. The old has passed away. He's now giving you a new nature. He's giving you a new birth. So will you sin at times now that you have this new nature? Of course you will. Will you still do things at times that you shouldn't do? Will you still struggle with sin? Of course you will because the sin nature is still there. But it's slavery, your slavery to it, and its mastery over you has been broken. And so the Bible encourages us, us to reckon it as dead and reckon ourselves as dead to it. You have a new heart. You have a new nature given to you by God. Sins that used to bring you pleasure, if you were born again now, they will bring you nothing but misery. And you may think, what is wrong with me? I used to do these things. I used to go with these crowds and do these things and get involved in these activities. I used to enjoy it. Now I'm miserable when I do that. What's happened with me? You've been saved. God's changed you. And so the things that once delighted you don't delight you anymore. A little girl was once being questioned by a skeptical older man about her recent new life in Christ. And he asked her, he said, did you sin before you were saved? And she said, yes. Simple, simple response. And then he said, do you sin now that you were saved? And she again said, yes. And he said, well, if you sin before you were saved and you sin now that you're saved, I don't see any difference. And she said, well, she said, the difference is this. She said, before I was saved, I ran towards sin. Now that I'm saved, I run away from sin. So there's a fundamental change. Was, was there still a problem with sin? Yes. But her, her direction in life had changed. Her desires had changed. Her direction had changed. And so God will change and save you with new life as you look to Christ. Being reconciled through Christ brings regeneration. It's a miraculous thing. It's the greatest miracle you'll ever see. Some folks may say, well, I'd love to see a miracle. I'd love to see God do something out of the ordinary. Watch God save someone. Stand back. See someone who has turned to Christ, and Christ has given that person new life, and just watch the change that God affects. You'll see nothing more miraculous, because what God has done on the cross is the greatest miracle by far, to be able to take a heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. And he's done that for each one of us who know Christ as Savior, who have been saved by him. So this morning, have you been reconciled to God? I'm not asking you, do you come to church? I'm not asking you, are, are you, are you, do you believe in Jesus? I'm not asking you those questions. I'm asking you, have you been reconciled to God? Have you been saved? Have you been regenerated? Well, preacher, I've never taken issue with the good Lord. I just try my best to be a good person, and I, I think he understands. The good Lord and I just get along okay. Friend, if you're in that kind of mindset where you really don't take issue with the Lord and you just do your own thing spiritually, by not being regenerated, he has issues with you because you are refusing the salvation that he has provided. You're in rebellion against him. You and the rest of mankind are under his wrath. The Bible says you are estranged from God. You're living in opposition to God. And the only way that situation can be changed is for God to replace your old heart of rebellion with a new heart of obedience. You must be born again. I know that I've been born again. I know it because I have a relationship with Christ. I know what the scripture says. I, I've seen the change that God has made in me. It's not anything I've done. It's what God has done for me. And I know when I leave this earth, I will go to be with Christ because Christ has saved me. This morning, do you have confidence? Do you have assurance that God has saved you? I've talked to folks before in 35 years of ministry. You talk to a lot of folks. And, and one of the questions I've asked, are you a Christian? And I get this response. Well, preacher, I try. I try, preacher. I go to church as often as I can, and, and I try to put some money in the plate and, and whatever else they, they may come up with. You don't have to, to be concerned. You don't have to be tentative. You don't have to be timid about your salvation. You can know. Look to Christ and live. And if the Holy Spirit regenerates you and gives you his new life, you can know I have been saved through what Christ has done in me. 
this morning, do you know Christ? Do you know him as your Savior? Has he changed and transformed you as your, as your Lord? That's the greatest need that any of us has. The Holy Spirit most likely is dealing with some of us here this morning to come to him. He's drawing you. He's working with you. Don't resist. Just come. Just submit. Say, Lord, I look to you. Grant me the new life that I know that you can provide. Forgive me of my sins. And as you do that, he's faithful to do so. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for this, this verse of Scripture and the, the wonderful experience we have of being reconciled with Christ. Father, we pray that, that everyone here would understand that the critical need of being born again. We need you to save us. We cannot save ourselves. We need you to act upon us and to change that sinful heart and to give us a new nature. And Father, we thank you for the provision that's been made for us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Father, some of us here need to, to be saved. Some of us perhaps need to be sharing this message of reconciliation with others because we have lost folks around us. They need to know Christ. They need to hear the scripture. They need to have new life in him. And you've made us your ministers of reconciliation. So may we be faithful with that task. May we pray. May we reach out and speak the truth in love and see these people drawn to Christ and experience the new life that only he has to provide. Father, we know that you can work with all ages. You can work with those who are very young. You can work with those who are very old. You can work with those who are anywhere in between. But Father, this morning we pray that you would work and that you would move in our midst. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. If you're here this morning and you would like to respond, to the message. If God is working your heart and mind and you would like to come to the front, I'll be glad to talk with you. I'll be glad to pray with you. Uh, Jonathan would be willing to do the same. And perhaps God's dealing with you about being saved. Perhaps God's dealing with you about sharing with others. Or perhaps you're wanting to come into this church and learn more about that. I can't think of a better church to be a part of than Beulah. Wonderful congregation. So, but if God's dealing with you this morning, respond to him. Be obedient. To his calling upon your life. Number 252 is our hymn, Only Trust Him. Let's stand as we sing the first and the last verses. Tony McDaniel, would you close us in prayer, please?